one's called Ross. <coughs> and Electricity Markets Authority and SSC Generation Limited Partner. Yes, my lords. May we pick it up, please, at the Gemma decision. That's Supplemental Bond 2, tab 14, page 244. were taken to aspects of this decision yesterday. I'm going to whistle through it if I may and just point out some uh, additional points from us. Yep. Page 244, last paragraph, it recognises that as a result of the SCR decision, there was going to be a requirement to set the TGR, the residual transmission tariff, to zero and to implement the so-called connection exclusion. Turning over the page, at page 245, Gemma confirmed that they've approved the original proposal as submitted by GRID which has the following characteristics. Bullet point one, all local charges for local circuits will be excluded, so within the connection exclusion. And then bullet point three, no element of the SUOS charges will be taken into account when assessing compliance. <coughs> if we could then please go to page 247. Is that... 245, the first... 245, the first paragraph. The first the bullet point, that's... that's first bullet point is connection so exclusion. Over-exclusive. That's over-inclusive. Over-inclusive. For the purposes over of the pot of charges yeah. that are going to the connection exclusion, therefore under-inclusive for generator charges in the numerator. Yeah, okay. Third bullet is the source I'm coming on to. Yeah, okay. I'm using this as an opportunity to sweep up um, the findings in relation to... Yeah. The, the grounds of appeal. Two, the 247. 247, please. First substantive paragraph. Uh, we see that the effect of the ITC regulation is to prescribe a range. It then says it also prescribes the calculation required to determine compliance. And we say that is a reflection of the mandatory nature of the requirement to do the calculation and to get the elements in it right. Page 248. Um, halfway down the page, there's a paragraph that begins, where projected to nuance revenues. Uh, and it's dealing there with the ex-ante position as it existed when TGR was being used as the residual adjustment mechanism. But it's telling, yeah. we say, that there's the following line. The CUSC calculation may not, however, be effective in achieving that aim if it's formulated on the basis of an incorrect interpretation of the limiting regulation. I'm sorry, Mr. Kidd, where are you reading from? Uh, so that, um, well, that's the uh, fifth paragraph down on that page. Second paragraph under the heading GB charges and the limiting regulation. Oh, yeah, sorry, I was on the page. Uh, 248. Two, um, the last sentence in that fifth paragraph, literally halfway down the page, mm -hmm. says the CUSC calculation may not, however, oh, yeah. be effective in achieving that aim if it's formulated on the basis of an incorrect interpretation of the limiting regulation. Yeah. And I'm just pausing there. You have my submission from yesterday. Yeah. That of course, there was nothing in the CUSC dealing with the connection exclusion expressly at that stage. So it was simply a question of the calculation that GRID was carrying out mm -hmm. independently. Uh, had, was at risk of being wrong if they put the wrong things in. We say that's a for sure the case now because they have put in an incorrect uh, definition into the yeah. CUSC. We then see two paragraphs down that um, CMP 317327 sought to do two things. One set TGR to zero which immediately got rid of the adjustment mechanism that was available. Uh, and secondly, to seek to implement the correct interpretation of the connection exclusion. Mm -hmm. And it's on that second point that we say, uh, uh, with respect, Gemma failed to secure that outcome. If we then please turn to page 250. Uh, halfway down the page, under modification proposal, it describes the amalgamated modification proposal as being one, to identify the charges to be paid within the scope of the connection exclusion, two, to set TGR to zero, 
and three, to raise new proposals as regards to the treatment of facilities charges. So those are the three broad endeavours in relation to uh, the overall approach. At page 251, we find the start of uh, Gemma's modular treatment of the issues. And in the first substantive paragraph, beginning a brief description of each of the modules is provided below. And for your note, the second bullet deals with um, the ASC, the Ancillary Services Exclusion, vis-a-vis -vis the SUAS charges, i.e. congestion management. And the final bullet deals with the connection exclusion. So that's anchoring where we are. Of course, uh, a large number of the 83 WACOMs, the proposals which came from a handful of companies, were dealing with things that are irrelevant for those two issues. So it was dealing as well with, for example, whether there should be a phased implementation, whether there should be a target range, uh, whether there should be an error margin, the other modules that are put in at page 251. So the actual differences in terms of WACOM treatment for connection exclusion and the source charges was relatively modest. We see in the table that the source options were, were one of two, so it was binary. Either include some source charges or exclude the source charges in the totality. And then for completeness at page 252, the three options available essentially for um, definition of connection assets were either all charges, all local charges, charges for generator only spurs or GOS, and then charges for all local circuits except those which were pre-existing, shared or shareable. So the, the, the scope of dispute on the two core issues that um, we're dealing with here was relatively modest, albeit it's fair to say nobody agreed on exactly what asset should be within the scope of the connection exclusion. If we can then please look at page 253. There's a section at the bottom that begins our decision. And in the next paragraph after the beginning of that section, it says, we do not consider that any of the proposals incorporate the correct interpretation of the connection exclusion. Notwithstanding this, we've concluded the original proposal would be likely to avoid the imminent risk of a breach of the ITC that is posed by the status quo and better facilitate the achievement of the ACOs. We also consider that approval of the original proposal would be consistent with our principal objective and statutory duties. Just pausing there, our case, of course, is that if you've approved a definition of the connection exclusion that's wrong in law, you fail to comply with the requirements under Articles 18 and 19 of the Electricity Regulation 2009 to give effect to the ITC regulation, and the ITC regulation is itself, in any event, directly applicable. Therefore, there's an error of law. Um, could we then please finally turn to page 256 in terms of the run-through of this decision? This sets out the treatment of congestion management, and it notes that uh, at the top of the page that there was a new definition of congestion management uh, by reference to uh, the, the definition of congestion management was now found in the definition of ancillary services provided through a mixture of the recast electricity direction tw uh, directive 2019 and the recast electricity regulation 2019. And I'll take my lords to those two provisions in a moment. This has arisen as a result of a workroom paper that was raised by RWE saying that these should be treated as outside the scope of the ancillary services exclusion. And then right at the end it says, for reasons set out in Legal Annex 1, we consider the source charges should not be included in the cost calculation. And that's any source charges. So um, I will turn to uh, Legal Annex 1 in a moment once I've shown my lords the overall structure of uh, the new definition of ancillary services. Could I um, very briefly recapitulate some points, drawing together some threads from yesterday in the light of the suggestion, principally I think from Lord Justice Green, that uh, there could be staggered implementation lawfully in this case. Um, with respect, we say that's not right. Uh, what we've seen in this case is a first stage misimplementation of the ITC regulation by the incorporation of an erroneous legal definition in a binding document. And then that, is, that remains the position, and there was no direction, for example, from Gemma to GRID to change it. In a, there was no sunset clause. There was no direction to bring in modification. It was simply an expectation. So that the illegality remained in place until, in fact, the order of Mr Justice Swift, 
when Gemma then brought forth, forward a direction uh, and that changed it. Can I ask you to consider the position of Farmer Giles? Your trespassing, Mr Beale, on Farmer Giles's land. He comes along and he says to you, Mr Beale, get off my land. And you say, well, how do I do that? He says, go to the gate, open the gate and get out. Three stages. Stage one involves you trespassing, but you're on the way out. Stage two, you're still on the right, the trespass side of land as you open the gate. Stage three, you leave. Is that unlawful because it permits trespass in stages one and two? Um, what is uh, unlawful there is the act of trespass. Um, the act of trespass is committed. But, but now, everybody accepts that's the case. Everybody accepts the starting point is unsatisfactory and nobody's challenged that. But this case isn't about that conclusion, it's about how you get out of it. But, but the, the parallel, therefore, is the commission of a tort, the crystallisation of a tort, and then relief. And so by parity of reasoning here, you have an illegal act, and the question then is, how does the authority, public authority... You're not challenging the illegal act. You're not challenging the, the, the CMA decision, which said that the situation is unlawful. You didn't challenge the GEMA review on the basis that it was premised upon a starting point of illegality. You're challenging the get off my land, get out of breach. My Lord, we're not. We're, we're challenging. We were saying there was a legal error through the adoption of a construction in the cask, which uh, is wrong in law. And the consequence of that can be seen when uh, one bears in mind what the ITC regulation requires you to do. It requires you not simply to ensure that compliance is within the permitted range. It also requires you to get the calculation right. I wonder really, you're saying they shouldn't have done what they did do by way of escape, if I can put it that way. They should, have done, they should effectively have done nothing. They should have left things as they were. Or even well, that, in which case, the illegality would have, would have remained. Um, because they had no power to enforce their... Gemma had no power, as I understand it, to, um, to enforce its own proposal. Well, they, they did, my lord, because that's what they did once Mr Justice... Well, they, could, they could suggest a model. There's no, there's no statutory um, power to do that, is there? I mean, it's just... Uh, you do it, and, and presumably um, National Grid uh, will follow suit. But they don't. I don't think there's any statutory. Well, the, the license, so the license framework uh, requires uh, Gemma as licensor to require Grid to act on the basis of license conditions. Those license conditions permit Gemma to give directions to Grid as licensee. And we saw yesterday in Tab 25, Supplemental Bundle 2 the provision in uh, CUSC 8.17A1, which was the provision finally used. But that's a code, and I just wonder, I mean, we, we haven't looked at the Electricity Act or no. the powers to enforce license conditions or whether there's a license condition on National Grid simply to comply, to comply with the law, including retained EU law, European law. And we haven't really grappled with the mechanisms. Standalone, in, where the initiative lies with the regulator as opposed to having to treat with the regulated community. But, but I wonder if this case is not so much about Annex B, it's really about what you have to do to comply with Article 17 and 18 of the Directive, um, to bring yourself from a state of non-compliance into compliance. So uh, I think it's Article 18 and, and 19, I may be wrong. Uh, yes, it's yes, 18 and 19. Uh, One is 2009 regulation. It's regulation, it's the duty of regulators to comply and the duty of regulators to ensure compliance. Yes. So, uh, uh, we'll come on to this, but Article 18 of the 2009 regulation is the virus for the ITC regulation. Article 19 then says, and national regulatory authorities must, let's turn it up now, just so that we've got it yeah. um, firmly in mind. But I, mean, I think I'm, I'm, I'm recasting the issue slightly differently. <coughs> One or both of those apply to the situation. Regulator has a duty to get out of the mess that it's in. So this was its attempt to get out of the mess. So we're in a situation of how do you comply with 18 and 19, uh, and, and your starting point is that there is a breach. Now you're simply saying there's a breach, well we know that, the question is how do you get out of it? Well, my Lord, necessary in the glide path involves some diminishing level of non-compliance until you get to compliance. This is a breach of their own making, which they've consciously adopted. Well, because possibly, I, I think it's been assisted by 84 non-compliant proposals. <coughs> they, they had a choice, my Lord, which was to accept the proposal, which they did, in the knowledge that it was wrong in law. 
or they could have operated the send back procedure and said, go away and try harder. They could have directed their own modification, which they then could have approved, which is what they did subsequently. They could simply uh, have, um, well, it's the four aspects that we looked at. Yes, those are a regulatory quagmire. One way or another, they're all fall short of a, a freestanding power to wallop. Well, the 8.17A1, 8, 8. Uh, page 454 of It's as near as you get as to something which is freestanding. But it says the authority may direct the company to raise a cusp modification. Well, they are. May direct them to raise a proposal as opposed to us deciding. Well, they then did do that. They directed a very tight timetable over nine yeah, days and, and got it through. We understand that. It's more convoluted than a freestanding power to take a decision. Mm. Well, they could simply have left the status quo ante, where yeah. the ITC regulation could have required a calculation to take place in the ether, and say, there you go, keep on doing what you're doing, but for goodness sake, we need transparency on this. Could have done. Um, they didn't. They didn't. And that's the point that Mr. Justice Swift makes in paragraph 43 of the judgment, where he says, well, look, you chose to do it this way. If you choose to do it this way, you've got it wrong. Part of the reason they chose to do it this way is because they had 84 non-compliant proposals. So, I mean, you know, there's, ch there's chicken and egg. And they, it doesn't matter whether it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. They are where they are. Whether there's better ways of dealing with it in the future, I'm no doubt they'll consider. But the question is, how do they get out of the mess? And that's what, that's what they were doing, getting out of the mess. And actually, the Gemma decision is very clear on that. It's a single decision with a glide path, in which you do it in stages. It's not two decisions. It's one decision where the end result of the decision is compliance. And yes, there's that word expect, which the judge picked up on. We expect NG ESO to put forward a proposal, but... My Lord, to respect, there is have. no legally binding solution whereby a compliant outcome is guaranteed by what Gemma did. What is guaranteed by what Gemma did is the lawful, unlawful adoption of an unlawful construction of a legal term. Everybody agrees on that. Um, it's yeah. a question that that's stage one. Your class didn't put forward a compliant proposal, did they? Well, I mean, none, none of the proposals, I don't know how many of the 83 came from your clients. Uh, but none of the 83, whoever they came from, um, put forward a proposal which is compliant with the connection exclusion as properly interpreted. Wacom 7 and Wacom 14 were put forward by Mr. Graham of SSC. Uh, Wacom 7, on the connection exclusion point, suggested generator owned spurs should also be included in the connection exclusion. Wacom 14 adopted a proposal whereby any shared or shareable asset would be included in the connection exclusion. Neither of those found favour with Gemma. Um, um, I think Mr. Tindall adopted two separate Wacken proposals, 73 and 78 or 79, uh, where he had mildly different treatment of phasing and various other bits and bobs and having a target. But there were essentially four core proposals from my client, um, which <clears throat> we advanced before Mr. Justice Swift as being preferable to the approach that was adopted. Now, um, that whole issue is no longer with us because the actual specific definition and application of the connection exclusion is not for today. But um, the other, of the other 83 proposals, in addition to the original proposal, a number of them were simply variations on a theme that had nothing to do with either the source or the connection exclusion. So in fact, we could probably whittle it down to a dozen. But I, I appreciate there's still a dozen options that are floating around with different permutations. Um, but that's I'm not being critical when I say that. I mean, everybody's entitled to formulate a proposal which they think is, what they hope is compliant, which suits their commercial ends best. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. But the regulator has got to make sure it isn't, uh, un, uh, under the yoke is too strong a word, but under some degree of artificial pressure from the regulated community, which may be what's happened here because the code involves the regulator in not being able to take its own decisions. My Lord, as they say in France, to know everything is to forgive everything. And yeah. yeah, but we're wise with hindsight here, we're <laughs> well, looking at things after the event. The, the, the hindsight position is the same as the foresight position here, which is there was a knowing adoption of a construction of a piece of EU legislation that was wrong in law. But and you, you have my you submission just, from you yesterday. You mentioned Wacom 7 and Wacom 14 a moment ago. But page 264 of the Gemma decision, they took the brief, or they reached the conclusion that both of those Wacoms were under-inclusive. Yes, they did reach that. They did not comply with connection exclusion. That was the view they reached. Yes. And that wasn't challenged. Oh, it was. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's been challenged.
both before the CMA and then subsequently before Mr. Justice Swift. And Mr. Justice Swift has said um, the application of the connection exclusion, once you've got the correct definition, it will be a matter for the facts of the case. Um, what Gemma have done is simply cut and pasted the definition from the regulation into the cusk. And so I hesitate to use this word, but that's a battle that is yet to come as to how that gets applied. Because there's quite a lot of work to be done on Gemma's definition as to at what point an asset at a particular location in the network became shared, which requires quite a lot of yeah. archaeology. Or, no, but not, not for today. During the Mercury case, I mean, the question of how you allocate or attribute costs is, is complicated. Yes. Um, can, can I just uh, make the very short point? You've got my submissions from yesterday. I don't wish to weary your patience any no, no. further. Um, but how does that then plug in? Well, the answer is, having chosen to implement the ITC regulation through the approval of the original proposal, what was important was that each time any calculation was carried out, it was compliant with the ITC regulation. Yeah. So if the National Regulatory Authority <coughs> decided to put in place an ex-ante and an ex-post system, as they did, each of those calculations had to be compliant with the EU law. And uh, how that's done, uh, I accept entirely, my Lord and Lord Justice Green's point, that there is no mandatory requirement in the ITC regulation saying when that calculation has to be performed. But the point is, Gemma, as an NRA, National Regulatory Authority, chose to put in place in the CUSC, through its approval of the proposal, two separate calculations. One was ex ante, one was ex post. And one of the points that was put to me uh, yesterday, I think by Lord Justice Snowden, was, well, does the ex ante matter because you've got the ex post residual fallback? Could I just clarify that both matter? Both matter as a matter of law because the ITC regulation as a matter of EU law requires the calculation to be compliant with the ITC regulation. If you've got the wrong definition, the calculation won't be. Secondly, as a matter of practice, the consequence of the ex ante calculation is that tariff will be set for the forthcoming year and will then form the basis for forecasts of charges for that year and the next, in essence. And so if you have too many generation charges being taken out of the numerator in that calculation, you will be setting tariffs for the future pricing year on an incorrect basis. And the wrong signals, to adopt Lord Justice Green's point, the wrong signals will be sent to the market. Now, that doesn't actually matter whether you get the calculation wrong in our favor or against us. If it's wrong, then you simply get the wrong market signals, which then cuts across the market harmonizing uh, uh, purpose behind the ITC regulation, which was to harmonize to, to the extent considered possible the setting of generation charges so that people could compete on a level playing field. See recital 10 to the regulation that my other friend, Ms. Smith, read out yesterday. And so, if, as is the case, we end up with a position where there are two separate calculations that are implemented into the CUSC, and each of those calculations are wrong, then that has practical effects both for tariff setting and also for the remedy, because any ex post reconciliation will also be wrong. I did say yesterday I would hand up uh, the relevant missing bit of the CUSC that ties in the reconciliation process more generally. So this is paragraph 3.13 of the task. Um, those who sit behind me, I think, have made copies available to everyone else. I don't propose to do more than invite your lordships to cast a very brief eye over it. At pages internal 17 and 18, there's uh, general reconciliation <coughs> provisions, which broadly, well, they do match, I hope, the time scale I gave my lords yesterday. So there's a generation reconciliation statement by the end of April, 30th of April. Uh, the sums due under that from the generators are then due, C 3.13.6, 30 days after the date of the invoice. And then there's an initial demand reconciliation statement by the 30th of June, so you have demand tied up, and then there's subsequently a demand, final reconciliation statement on demand. So you, you, you work out the generation position, you work out what they're going to pay, you then have the pro rata treatment of demand so that everything ties up. That's the reconciliation process. There is a time limit for it. And the ex post reconciliation ITC calculation was tied in with that because it was incorporated into the calculation. Now, a, a, a final
final point, if I may, on Table 4.3 and the CMA decision. I, I don't propose to turn it up, but I'll just give you my two cents on it. Um, that table was comparing two hypothetical positions because it was comparing an existing position. Is that the status quo ante decision, looking at the various options and working out? It was the figure in red that produced a very high figure. The for 453 exactly. under the zero. Yes. So there were three different options. The first option involved treating the TGR as still being the adjustment mechanism, which we know was wrong, and then treating the proper definition of the connection exclusion as being that incorporated in Gemma's decision, even though it didn't find its way into the cusp, which again we know is wrong. <coughs> so it was their ideal scenario, their ideal outcome, which didn't exist, against an existing scenario which had been amended. So you, you get a very big spread. If, if what you look at, my lord, is the second entry in that line, you end up with what should be the position under the post-CMA decision 2018, which is the treatment of generator-only spurs as being within the connection exclusion, and then you have transmission generation charges uh, substantially in the black uh, to a high figure. The Gemma decision didn't replicate that table. It, it Gemma contented itself with the broad description of a serious and imminent risk of breach, and which is a slightly, they haven't quantified it, but they simply recognise that however one quantifies it, there's a risk of breach and it's more than de minimis. That was premised on the assumption that the TGR remains in place. And of course they'd taken the decision to remove the TGR, so they needed to have a, a different adjustment mechanism. But that, was the, that was the basis for which they were proceeding. Yes. The, 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 the code as drafted created a, a risk a breach which okay. needed to be cured. Only if you plugged in the wrong definition of the connection exclusion. Yeah, yes. But there was no provision in the CUSC no, for, no, for that. Um, but, but that was the premise of the CMA decision in 2018. I accept that. Um, within those parameters, yeah. everything that's been said is correct. But what I'm saying is one needs to push the parameters to work out what is actually going on as the mechanic. Well, to a degree. I mean, the, you know, from our perspective, we, we, we simply we would take as a starting point that there was something to be cured. In a sense, what it was or how deep it was may not be to the point. The judge accepted there was something to be cured. We've seen the CMA's analysis. So the question is, if there's something to be cured because it's legally non-compliant, how do you get from that to a situation of remedy? Well, I don't think, with respect to anything in the CUSP, was legally non-compliant because it didn't seek to implement one way or another the ITC regulation. The problem came because GRID was in practice at the risk of plugging in the CUSC values in a different context to the ITC regulation. And there was a disparity between what the CUSC had said on its face in terms of connection charges being X, uh, and then the ITC regulation calculation being different and proceeding on a different basis because you had to add in, at the very least, generator-only spurs. So that's where the, the difficulty came. That's where the discrepancy arose. That, with respect, isn't non-implementation of the ITC regulation because the ITC regulation was always directly applicable. That was simply not, that wasn't implemented. And Zabon and the other CJU cases I was referred to the court to make it clear that in the ordinary case, you won't implement a regulation. There's nothing legally wrong with that. It was just unsatisfactory because of the dichotomy between the approach in the CAS and what was then required in the ether in a calculation for the ITC regulation. Um, uh, that, if I may, um, allows me to move on to the cross appeal, unless your lordships have any further questions for me. Could we pick it up, please, by looking at the uh, recast regulation very briefly for, for one point, and then diving into the recast directive. So the recast regulation is at Bundle of Authorities, tab 7. So that's Bundle of Authorities 1, tab 7. Page 299. Just for you to suggest somewhere convenient. Yes. Which way um, going. I hope your lordship has a, a four files. Um, perhaps the other section of 14 of the cusk is in SB1. Tab 12, SB1, uh, and perhaps it would make sense for it to go at 193A onwards. There 
is at the front of the cusp section. Tab 7, page 299. And I'll unfortunately have to do a bit of a paper chase through this regulation uh, around 12 o'clock, I hope. So the, the essential, di the, the, the single point, uh, costs applicable <coughs> to infrastructure only or costs applicable to the entire system management, congestion management costs, that's the issue. All or not, all or just a bit. Um, it, it, it's perhaps a little more nuanced than that, but essentially the, what we see in Article 260 is a definition in the recast regulation of ancillary services yep. by reference to Article 248 of the directive. directive yep. The directive then in Bundle of Authorities 2. That distinguishes balancing the non-frequency services, so it's not including management, uh, congestion management. Yes. So for the purposes of what is the definition of ancillary services, yep. what the directive does is say any uh, matters, services, etc. to do with congestion management won't fall within the scope of ancillary services. And that, the reason, of course, that's relevant is the ITC regulation has the ancillary services yep. exclusion. Um, if we're on page 565, which I hope we are, of the recast directive, tab 9, Fund of Authorities 2. 565. 565. This is Article 248. It's the Article 2 definitions in the Recast Directive. As I hope I've made clear, the Recast Directive isn't applicable in the UK because it entered into effect after IP completion day, well, in fact, two hours after IP completion day. Um, but um, uh, what we see at the top of the page is a series of definitions. Firstly, congestion means congestion as defined back in the recast regulation. Balancing, again, is defined by reference to the recast regulation. But balancing and congestion have separate definitions. We then see a reference to balancing, balancing energy. And again, that tracks back to the recast regulation. Balance responsible party, etc. 48 then says ancillary service means a service necessary for the operation of a transmission or distribution system, including balancing and non-frequency ancillary services, but not including congestion management. And then we have, for good order, a definition of non-frequency ancillary service in the next paragraph, uh, which is not the service that we're considering here. While I am on the recast directive, um, and while your lordships have it open, please could I invite you to consider two further uh, definitions. First, at page 564, paragraph 35, transmission system operator. <coughs> means the natural or legal person responsible for operating and ensuring the maintenance of and if necessary developing the transmission system in a given area and where applicable its interconnections with other systems and for ensuring the long-term ability of the system to meet reasonable demands for the transmission of electricity. The reason why uh, interconnections is where applicable is not every TSO will have an interconnector. But where it is is part of the overall system. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Uh, could we please go to page 587, and then I'm done with this directive. We see the tasks of transmission system operators are there set out, and they're responsible for area for, under subparagraph D, managing electricity flows on the system. 587, my lord. Uh, article 40, subparagraph 1D. One of the tasks of a TSO is to manage electricity flows in the system, taking into account exchanges with other interconnected systems. To that end, the transmission system operator shall be responsible for ensuring a secure, reliable, and efficient electricity system, and for ensuring the availability of all necessary ancillary services. 
and those, including those provided by demand response and energy storage facilities, and so on. We then see at, at Roman, sorry, uh, subparagraph 1H, that they're also responsible for collecting what are called congestion rents and payments under the intertransmission system operator compensator, compensation mechanism, which I'll come on to in a moment, and then procuring ancillary services to ensure operational security. And so we have ancillary services in general being dealt with in a separate subparagraph from the treatment of managing electricity flows on the system. That um, is all I need uh, for present purposes from the results. So the latter is balancing, and the former is congestion management. So the, the balancing is just making sure the input correlates to the output. For the system as a whole. For the system as a whole. And congestion management is, is that which occurs, when as I understand it, and perhaps I think something we'd like just to explain is yeah. how that operates in practice. We understand that it's some physical incapacity within the system mm. which prevents input being properly matched with output. So you've got a bottleneck and you've got a capacity constraint, but it's something <coughs> physical. What, what, what does that mean in practice? We get, we, we've seen the definitions. So I'll, I'll be taking the course of I may to just a very short excerpt from Mr. Graham's witness statement, where he gives an example of the Cheviot constraint, which is the gap between Scotland and, and England, yes. where a very large amount of generation from hydro and, and renewable sources in Scotland is suddenly funneled through yeah. quite a small section of the grid. And if you've got too much generation being put into the system at that stage, you, you then get the bottleneck bundle to describe. And then you don't have enough flow coming for um, extreme demand in the south. So typically, the, the south is a, a high demand area, low generation area, and Scotland is a high generation, low demand area. And so managing the flows between them, what you can sometimes do, if the power cables are fizzy and it looks as though the, the, the thing's not going to go through very well, you can pay people to start generating in the south of England to reduce the demand so that the, there's then a more equal flow and you can pay generators to stop generating in Scotland so that there's less... So this is congestion bottleneck. management or balancing? This is constraint management, which we say is the same as congestion management. And that would be an example of what's called an internal congestion because it's an internal issue within the GB system. But it's an example of, EG, of GB congestion which can then affect the flows of electricity over, for example, the Irish interconnector. So it's congestion within a system as opposed to at the interconnector. Precisely. And this is the reference to that example? Um, the reference to that example is in um, Mr. Graham's witness statement. I've got a note that's <coughs> Sorry, did you say it's an example of a constraint within a system? I yes. The way you described it is that it's at the interconnect between the Scottish and the English. <coughs> My Lord, there isn't an interconnect between Scotland and England because they're part of the single GP, GB electricity network. Between member states. Right. And an yeah. interconnector is only between member states. So there's an interconnect between us and Northern Ireland because Ireland, Northern Ireland is, would post the protocol, part of the Irish electricity <coughs> system, the island of Ireland electricity system. And so there is an interconnector there because Ireland, Northern Ireland, for those purposes, is treated as being part of the member state of Ireland. I, I yep. express that loosely. Yep. That's not the correct legal position, but I hope, I hope your Lordship understands it. It's that which reflects the and or, I think, in Article 2.4, which says you can get capacity constraint either within a system or at an inner connector. Uh, I think that was the definition in the 2009 uh, regulation, not the recast regulation. Yeah. Uh, but I will be, go I'll be yeah. doing the paper chase, I'm afraid, for all of them, if time permits. Uh, but the, the single point is, you can get capacity both within a system and at an interconnector. Yes. And both have to be managed and yes. both result in the incurring of costs. Yes. And they're managed in different ways. And, and the question, therefore, is whether under the legislation that distinction is drawn out from the language of the various regulations which applied at the date of the decision. At the date of the decision, yes. You say they weren't. There's no distinction. Uh, uh, I will hope to convince this court that there is a, a, a suite of legislation that all points in the same direction. And there isn't a logical or purposive reason for constraining congestion as being constrained to, I might use limited, the constraint, to limited, confined to, to, <laughs> limited. Uh, interconnected congestion. That's that's the shape of my argument. Just so again, Tom, I was just going to say, are you going to give us Mr. Graham's? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Congestion management, it's page 442.
So it's, uh, it's dealt with by uh, Mr. Grenon at page 442, my lord, paragraph 16 yeah, to 18. It's where he talks about the chevy of constraint. Yes. <coughs> supplementary to supplementary bundle two, tab tab 22, page 442. Um, while, while I may say so, while I've got your lordships looking at the evidence, if this I is, this is the business about um, wind farms, for example, pumping too much electricity into the system. And that's why if you drive through northern France, you see quite often the wind farms aren't, aren't the, the, the turbines aren't turning. And the right. reason for that is, is it, this, this is congestion yeah. management. They've, they've been constrained off. They've been constrained off yeah. um, because if there are too many of them at once. And it's, it's one, of the, one of the issues is, is, as I understand it, storage of electricity from that offshore wind farms is a, is a critical question. That's a very difficult issue. And we haven't yet solved. There are a series of solutions in the pipeline involving um, storage of deep latent, sea storage and well, so forth. latent electricity in a lake, for example, and then letting the water down when electricity prices are high to generate electricity and then using electricity prices when they're low to pump it back up. It sounds like a place not to go swimming. <laughs> no. Right. Especially on a hot day. No. Um, and just before you do, while we interrupt you yet again, just so we understand the commercial imperative behind this, on, on one view, you'd have thought the generators would want the charge to be as low as possible, not to include costs in it. But but I think the CMA deal with that in, in Section 8. They, they basically say that because the emitted range imposes a cap, it's better for the charges to be in the cost rather than outside of it. Is that right? Well, it Fundamentally, it's a question of law, but in terms of the commercial in terms imperative, of commercial, yeah, yeah. the commercial imperative, I think it's um, hundreds of millions of pounds for constraint management charges um, that aren't being included in the numerator for that particular calculation. But the, the generators want it to be out of the exclusion in, into the cost. Into the cost. They want it to be in the cost because that way, um, the subject to the cap, subject to the cap, you're more likely to breach the cap, and therefore other things being equal you are likely to have lower generation costs. And the reason why that's relevant is because that then improves the competitive advantage of my clients in the cross-border electricity market. Absolutely understood. That, that's, there's a slightly economical brief statement in paragraph 8.1 of the CMA decision which explains that. And that's the explanation for it. Mm. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and the figures are, are, are sufficiently large that it's highly likely to impact. Because at first blush, it's counterintuitive. You sort of think to yourself, well, why do they want to include this in the well, calculation? Well, it starts from the premise the that that calculation, the, the purpose behind the ITC regulation, as my Lord, Lord Justice Green identified, was this is soft harmonization to promote yeah. cross border trade. Uh, so the more in tune with each other the generation charges are, the lower the impediment to cross border trade. Yeah. So if you've got an outlier like GB, which is already a 2.5 per megawatt hour as a cap, that's five times the size of a European cap, and then that cap isn't effective because a whole bunch of charges that generators are paying, because we pay for the congestion management charges under the source. Mm -hmm. If those cap, if those charges are taken out of the calculation, then we're even worse off. Yeah, that's the basic point, and therefore we suffer a, a competitive disadvantage. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, while I have you on the evidence in SB2, would you be kind enough, please, to uh, take out uh, tab 16, page 295? I'll just do a whistle stop to Mr. Tindall's evidence. Two nine five. This is just so my lords have a, a, a sense of the practicalities and the dynamics of what's going on. So page 295, paragraph, I think it's uh, 4.5 through to 4.8. Mr. Tyndall um, describes constraints and how they've been described in various national courts. Please can I invite the court to read 4.5 to 
the difference between this and balancing? The balancing occurs in an uncongested system. And it should do. It should do. That's its benchmark, or that's its counterfactual. Yes. The system is uncongested, and you're just balancing inputs and outputs. Congestion is that which <coughs> stops the balancing process, but there, but involves different and discrete costs to manage. It, it does, um, as it happens, under the domestic system, not that this should guarantee the definition in the regulation, under the domestic systems, two separate codes dealing with balancing and, and congestion constraints. Um, this point is actually made by Mr. Tyndall then at paragraph 5.13 to 5.4, uh, where he explains how um, essentially congestion management enables you to avoid having to build more infrastructure. Because if you can solve the problem of the constraints in the infrastructure by rerouting the flows internally within the system, then you don't have to build the cables. So the, the problem, in a sense, is not having enough cables to transport the power from high generation to high demand. Instead of building cables, you can constrain people off, balance the flows, and that may be a cheaper way of doing it than building new cables. And that's the point Mr. Tyndall makes at 5.13 to 5.5. He also makes the additional point be kind enough to read, to read through to 5.9. That this is so 5.1 to 5.9, please. I'm sorry it's a long section, but it deals with two things. Firstly, the emergence <coughs> of congestion as an issue because of renewable wind. As my Lord the Chancellor indicated, we've had a massive growth in wind generation in Scotland that has reduced this problem, but the problem is necessary for us to meet climate change targets. But it, 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 it's a benefit that's brought a on Barasta Richesse in terms of power. Um, it, perhaps it's easier if I just let you read rather than talk over you. So that explains, I hope, the, uh, what it looks like on the ground, what the charges are like, and um, why it's there. Coming, if I may, to uh, the treatment of this in the Gemma decision. This is dealt with in Legal Annex 1. So within Supplemental Bundle 2, which I think we have open, tab 14, is page 271. This is the beginning of Legal Annex 1, and it's dealing specifically <coughs> with BSC charges, which are no longer an issue. I'll just explain why that's the case. I'm, essentially, we raised a point before, this is just a swift on BSC charges, but it's become uh, commercially irrelevant because of changes to the system. Um, uh, the the source charge analysis begins at page 273 and is really encapsulated in paragraphs <coughs> 17 through to 21. Would the court be kind enough to read 17 through to 21?
the point that's essentially taken there is not, in fact, the argument that found favour uh, before either the CMA or um, Mr Justice Swift. The argument there is, yes, we accept congestion means the same thing as constraint, and constraint management is therefore what we're dealing with as a concept. But because the 2009... Um, because the 2010 ITC regulation was based on some ergo guidelines, and those guidelines seem to think that congestion, the management of congestion was an ancillary service, therefore it's an ancillary service, and they declined to apply the updated definition given by the recast regulation. Now, um, we say with respect that was an error of EU law. Um, uh, principally, they weren't applying the laws as applicable as of the date of the decision. Correct. Simple as that. It is as simple as that. Um, the argument that was raised before the CMA was that the, um, the new recast regulation, whilst it maintained in effect the ITC regulation, was not the parent regulation. The parent regulation was the electricity regulation 2009, and therefore you applied the ancillary services definition unamended. That was the, the definition in Article 248 of the directive, which brings congestion management into the charge and out of the exclusion. But it was said that that was a... a, a a subsequent event which could impact on yes. the proper definition of the ITC regulation which occurred prior. Now, but, but it was the law which was applicable as of the date of the decision. It was. And your Lordship will be aware from the FA Premier League case and elsewhere that as a matter of EU law, one looks at is the holistic approach to legislation, much like a, a domestic statute, where you have a statute that replaces another statute that maintains in effect the subsidiary legislation under it, there's usually a saving clause somewhere mm -hmm. there is in the recast regulation. That maintains in effect the subsidiary legislation even though the virus for it have switched from one parent statute to another parent statute. Mm -hmm. It's just basic constitutional principle. The EU has the same system. Um, for your Lordship's note, and, and perhaps we should just briefly turn it up, the Premier League decision confirms that um, uh, the Bundle of Authorities 2, tab 14, page 700, This was a case involving copyright directive, as my Lord Lord Justice Green will recall. Fondly, it was about sky decoders from Greece being used in pubs in Portsmouth, uh, and whether or not that infringed the copyright directive, amongst other directives. Uh, paragraph 187, <coughs> which is at page 786. we see that one of the questions was how to interpret a particular term in the copyright directive, namely communication to the public, and whether that included uh, TV as well as uh, audio, vision, uh, uh, audio and written works. Uh, paragraph 187, we see in accordance with recital 20 in the preamble, the copyright directive was based on principles and rules already laid down in the directives in force in the area of intellectual property. In those circumstances, and given the requirements of unity of the European Union legal order and its coherence, the concepts used by that body of directives must have the same meaning unless the EU legislature has, in the specific legislative context, expressed a different intention. Uh, finally, Article 3.1 of the directive, well, we don't need to do with that. So, uh, where you have a body of directives, and it's quite common in, in many areas of the law to have succeeding directives that establish things and tweak things and change things, financial services, telecoms, across the field, really. You may find subtly different evolutions in meaning to reflect either changing market conditions or just a changing appreciation of what the correct definition is. And here, the raw concept of congestion must necessarily be the same. But uh, what we have by way of clarification in the recast directive is confirmation that congestion management is not to be treated as a ancillary service. So there's good reason. Travaux, which explains why that shift occurred. We do have Travaux. They don't deal with that specifically, um, is my understanding. We, we can, I will take to the Travaux, which say in terms, we are aware there's an ITC regulation, and we are aware of the concept of congestion, and they um, infer, or one can infer from it, that they're treating congestion as both internal congestion and congestion on an interconnector. And the, there's no doubt that the focus of the EU legislation is going to be on a cross-border aspect, because otherwise you run into subsidiarity problems. 
and I accept that. But the question is, given the interconnected nature of the electricity transmission system, why should it make any difference where the congestion is actually suffered or if it's blocking flows or at risk of blocking flows? And what we'll see when we go through the suite of legislation is there are measures that are put in place by a TSO to deal with internal congestion where it has a cross-border relevance and internal congestion when it has a non-cross-border relevance. And both of them are within the suite of measures. One will impact on interconnectors and the other way. If you reduce congestion within a system, you reduce the hindrance to cross-border trade. Correct. That's the physics of it. Um, next authority to support the proposition that one should be looking at the amended definition and not the historic definition um, is a opinion of Advocate General Sharpston, I think. It's probably, I'm trying to short-circuit things slightly. Opinion of Advocate General Sharpston in the X case, which is Bundle of Authorities 2, tab 17, page 819. This opinion was dealing with uh, emission standards and there was an allegation of a car manufacturer using a defeat device to claim emission standards which were higher, i.e. more respectable, um, than were in fact achieved. There was a suite of legislation, there was a council regulation and there was a commission implementing regulation. And one derives that from uh, page 821, sets out parts of Regulation 715-2007. And the question of construction was whether or not a device that was intended to deal with emissions had to be in the tailpipe, in the exhaust section of the car, or whether you could have it in the software that was built into the, the, the head of the car, um, which was intended to deal with emission standards. Page 822, there's a reference to a piece of, of subsidiary legislation, which is a commission regulation implementing measures to give effect to the parent regulation. And it was that subsidiary legislation that the company relied upon. Advocate General Sharpston, starting at page 832, dealt with the question of construction. Um, certainly with this court, I needn't weary you with a recital of exactly what the canons of construction of EU law are, but what we see here is uh, Advocate General Sharpston characteristically adopting the standard approach under EU law. She starts off with a literal interpretation, page 832. Page 833, she deals with contextual interpretation. And then finally, at page 834, she deals with teleological interpretation. So that's the standard tripartite structure. Ordinary and natural meaning of the words, what's the context, how is it used in other legislation around it, and what's the purpose. The, at page 834, paragraphs 98 and 99, um, the Advocate General makes an observation about the relative hierarchy of the two pieces of legislation. And please can I invite you to read those two paragraphs, that's 98 and 99. And as applied to the present case, the, the ITC regulation came about through the exercise of a power under the 2009 regulation. Yes. Therefore, it is subsidiary to the regulation. Yes. And the superior instrument has now been changed. Yes. Through the directive 29th recast. Yes. Which repeals and replaces the entirety of the 2009 regulation. There's a saving provision in the recast regulation, which is worth probably turning to now on the top. I suppose the, the answer to this is the ITC regulation doesn't define ancillary. It doesn't tell you what's in it or what's out of it. No. That's always been defined by the superior regulations of the Council and the Parliament. That's correct. Uh, and Article 70 of the Recast Regulation, uh, which is at uh, page 347, Bundle of Authorities 1, tab 7. I'm sorry to dip around, but I need to deal with this at this point. Page 347, tab 7 of the Bundle of Authorities. Yeah. Article 70, the 2009 regulations repealed. References to the repealed regulation shall be construed as references to this regulation and shall be read in accordance with the correlation table in Annex 3. Annex 3 is at page 353, and you then see a host of measures replicating on the left hand side the relevant provision. And just for your note, uh, for example, the definitions all correspond to definitions that are broadly in Article 2 in each case. And then at page 355, 
the virus for the ITC regulation in the form of Article 18 mm. are replicated in Article 61. <coughs> it's page 355 at the bottom of the page we see 18 read across 61 and 61 then in the new parent regulation at page 341 establishes the framework under which the commission will issue guidelines of which we've got network codes and we've got guidelines the ITC regulation is formally a set of guidelines but they are binding that's at 341 So in our submission, um, there's no suggestion that the ITC regulation doesn't apply for, it clearly does. It's been retained in force. It wasn't amended by the recast regulation. But we need to read the ITC regulation holistically with the recast regulation and the recast directive. And that now provides an explicit definition of ancillary services that excludes congestion management. Now, the next proposition of law uh, that I seek to invite the court to consider is that where you have the same term used across uh, either the same legislative measure or across a range of measures dealing with the same area, you have to give it a consistent meaning. Would your lordships be kind enough to turn in vulnerable authorities two to tab 16? page 812, beginning of the uh, Vets Frankfurt case, uh, the issue was whether or not um, a particular retail number that was offering a help service to customers had to be provided at the basic rate and what that meant. Uh, and essentially, I think the retailers were using a geographical locational number, which charged out at a higher rate, so an 0800 number instead of a basic rate number. And the question was, what does basic rate mean? Uh, can I just ask you, the judge didn't accept the GEMA analysis. He accepted the CMA position, which was that you had to apply with the up-to-date definitions. I, I think Is there really any challenge to that proposition now? Yeah. It's not a question for you, but, but it wasn't the judge accepted your analysis that it was the most up-to-date. It was the regulations in, in force at the time of the decision. I, I didn't think this was an issue when we settled the um, main skeleton argument. There was then a respondent's notice that was issued to our main skeleton argument, which then accompanied three weeks later by a skeleton. And that skeleton appears to suggest that they are seeking to maintain that the 2009 definition alone should govern the definition in the ITC regulation. So I'm, I'm tilting at a windmill in the sense that I've got 15 minutes in reply on this point, rather than now I'm trying to get my retaliation in first. But... I just wanted to lay the legal landscape as to why my submission to you is that you need to apply the updated definition. Um, but in answer to my Lord's question, uh, and could I just clarify, um, the reason why I'm afraid our supplemental skeleton was so late was because we didn't get the skeleton argument dealing with the bulk of the cross-appeal points until the 5th of July. So we then prepared as soon as we could and responded to that, and that's why it took a week. Uh, and came in on the 12th. So I, I do apologise, 13th. I do apologise sincerely for that, but we did it as quickly as we could. And there was it's been a compressed appeal. Admirably short. The, the, the supplemental, well, by my usual standards, perhaps. 20 pages. Well, only 20 pages. Only 20 pages. Well, there's a lot to cover, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> Two shames. <laughs> the um, CMA judgment's quite long. Uh, the CMA decision is quite long, well, Mr. Justice. But we understand your position on yes. the, you know, the, the up to date law being yes. relevant. Maybe well, so you can see what the respondents have. I'm, I'm conscious I've only got 15 minutes this afternoon to reply. If I could just very quickly take you to page 817. <coughs> mm -hmm. what, what one sees from paragraphs 23 through to 27 is that the concept of basic rate. Um, the way that the court is, is interpreting it is consistent with other provisions, both in other directives and within the same directive, and it's seeking to do so to understand the, the purpose behind it. The purpose behind the basic rate was to reduce costs for consumers, and they've got something that doesn't work, and they've got to phone a helpline. So they, the court construed the concept of basic rate with that in mind, and didn't say that basic rate therefore applied to um, locational geographical numbers, 0800, because they were special rates. Um, it may well not be a controversial principle, um, but at least I've discharged my duty of uh, articulating.
articulated. Could we then please uh, move on to uh, deal specifically with the first round of appeal? Um, you will have seen from paragraph 49 of our skeleton that we essentially make five core points on the cross appeal. The first point is that one looks at the natural and ordinary meaning of the words. Now, if one looks at the definition of congestion in the recast regulation, which is Bund of Authorities, tab 7, page 297. We see that congestion is defined under subparagraph 4, halfway down the page. And congestion means a situation in which all requests from market participants to trade between network areas cannot be accommodated because they will <coughs> significantly affect the physical flows on network elements which cannot accommodate those flows. Now, there's no geographical restriction in that definition. In contrast, if one looks at uh, subparagraph 1, interconnector means a transmission line which crosses or spans a border between member states and which connects the national transmission systems of the member states. So our first point is that unlike interconnectors which imply a or expressly include cross-border flows, there's no such restriction on the definition of congestion. And if, indeed, if we then look at paragraph 6, structural congestion means congestion in the transmission system that is capable of being unambiguously defined, is predictable, is geographically stable over time, and frequently reoccurs. What is that aimed at? That's aimed at things like the Cheviot constraint. So there's an obligation on a transmission network operator to a trans sorry, transmission system operator to deal with structural congestion precisely because it, it, it's um, the interconnected system it risks gumming things up. Uh, uh, more broadly, we say congestion in, in the GB system is equated with constraints, as Gemma rightly found in Legal Annex 1. Mm -hmm. Now, the second point is purpose. The, the purpose behind this is to deal with a, a lack of ability of wires to take flows of energy. It's, it's that straightforward. So when one talks about congestion in the common cold, that's a, a, a block in the nose. It stops you breathing. You use a decongestion to enable you to breathe through. By parity of reasoning, you would use <coughs> congestion management techniques to deal with a congested bottleneck to enable the flows either to be dealt with across that cable or to be dealt with another way by reducing the flows on both sides, or rearranging the flows on both sides so that you don't get the, the bottleneck. You've seen now the evidence from Mr. Tyndall and Mr. Graham making clear what the function and purpose of uh, congestion is. Now, the next point is that Notwithstanding that there is no express confinement of the term to congestion on interconnectors in the general definition, in any event, that doesn't make any sense in the context of the ITC regulation. Why? Because interconnectors, people flowing electricity across an interconnector, who are the interconnecting units, don't pay generation charges. So the charges that are paid to reflect uh, interconnector congestion by interconnectors won't be brought into the calculation in the first place. They'll simply never be paid. So if we're dealing with charges arising from interconnector congestion, that isn't going to be something that is fed into. There's a different way of dealing with interconnected congestion, which is to have the ITC mechanism. And the ITC mechanism enables uh, uh, the costs associated with congestion on the interconnector to be borne by people on either side of the interconnection, then there's a compensation scheme between the two member states that are either side of it. But in addition, 
The other way of dealing with it is to have capacity allocation so that somebody has to uh, say, I will allocate, I want to buy a right to allocation of the interconnector in order to flow electricity across it. In the integrated system that we did have until we left the EU, that was all part and parcel of the same trading system because it was a coupled system. But um, regardless of that fact, the capacity allocation system isn't the same as imposing a charge because capacity allocation gives rise to a revenue stream in the hands of the uh, National Regulatory Authority. And I'll, I'll make all this good by, by showing you the, the provisions in due course. But for your note, in SB1 tab 8, at page 120, in a decision called P396, perhaps if you were a tab, it, it, it's SB1 tab 8, page, turn to page 124, I'll cut to the chase on this point. SB1 tab 8, page 124. This is part of a decision that Gemma took in relation to whether or not interconnecting units should be charged. The page, page, page charge. number again. Uh, 124. Sorry, what, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, which bundle are you in? Supplemental bundle 1, tab 8 is my reference. I hope I'm putting the wrong one. Page 124, this is the end of the decision. So in this case, Gemma had found that um, having to pay settlement charges under the BSC, certain charges recovered under the BSC, were network access charges. And we then see at page 124, Gemma took the view that network access charges are prohibited under the electricity regulation. So interconnecting units who are seeking to flow electricity across an interconnector as part of cross-border trade can't be charged the charges that are permitted by Article 18.3 of the Recast Regulation. 18.3 deals with network access charges, and uh, you will have seen that part of the purpose of the ITC regulation is to soft harmonize the network access charges that generators have to pay so as to um, encourage, so far as possible, cross-border trade. Well, interconnecting units don't pay those charges. Those, the relevant costs are recovered through a combination of capacity allocation, which produces a, a revenue stream, and the ITC mechanism that, the, that Gemma then refers to in the next paragraph. So, um, in a nutshell, if, the, if it were right that congestion related only to interconnector congestion and interconnectors can't pay network access charges, then you're never going to have a logical space for the exclusion to have applied to them in the first place. Now, we say uh, the concept of congestion covering both internal congestion and congestion on interconnectors is also apparent from Ofgem's own analysis of bidding zones. So one of the issues that has been spawned by this particular debate is, well, what's the difference between a, a network area, a bidding zone, and a member state? Well, a member state's clear, and the interconnector has to span member states. The new definition talks about allocating trade flows between network areas. That's different from a definition of bidding zones. And I'll, I'll come on, I'd like to do the paper chase if I may in one go, so I'll come on to explain what bidding zone means as a matter of legal construction. But what I'd like to refer the court to now is in Supplemental Bundle 1, tab 5, page 83, is a, a, an off-gem bidding zones literature review. So page 83, it's a paper from July 2014. A lot of this market analysis was then incorporated into legislation. <coughs> At the bottom of the page, we, say, we see what is a bidding zone. Please can I invite the court to read that paragraph? And 
the map overleaf of page 84 makes the point rather eloquently. In Ireland, for example, you have two separate parts, one part of a member state and another member state uh, joined. Within Italy, there are, I think, four separate, five separate bidding zones because they reflect uh, congestion constraint issues within that particular jurisdiction. And similarly with Sweden and Norway, they each have segmented bidding zone areas. I think it's actually six, because I think Sardinia is one as well. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, you're right. You can only just, just read it. <laughs> <laughs> Suspiciously similar green to um, Sicily. Very, very bizarre. Though. They've seems to have included Corsica. Zones, but there we are. Yeah, well, Corsica looks as though it's included in that as well, which would, of course, be part yeah, of France. Yeah, it's all rather odd as well, isn't it? Uh, but anyway, the, the, the point I'm essentially making is, look, you can have multiple bidding zones in a single member state, or you can have multiple member states going to a single bidding zone. Mm. So there is no correlation between member state flows and flows between bidding area, yeah. bidding zones. And in any event, the language the legislation uses is between network areas and not between bidding zones. And your lordships will see in a moment that there are repeated references to bidding zones in the recast regulation. If the definition of congestion had wanted to be tied into moving between two different bidding zones, then they would have said so. But instead, what they've done is they've used a very uh, general, broad, non-geographically specific term for congestion, which is, in, in, in my spectrum submission, is intended to encompass congestion that occurs internally within a transmission network and also congestion that occurs both between bidding zones and between, network, uh, between uh, member states. It covers the full range. It's as a broader definition of congestion you can get. And we'll see that it's reflected in the language of other, statu other legislation. Uh, and we see at uh, page 84, there's a reference to the CACM, the Congestion Management Network Code, and I'll, I'll, that's one of the pieces of legislation I'll come on to, which was all about optimizing uh, bidding zones for capacity allocation purposes. Now, just so, again, you have it in pictorial form, what we see at page 92 is an example of the Cheviot constraint. And what uh, Ofgem indicates in this document, in the second paragraph, is that if bidding zones are not deline delineated according to network constraints, there's an inherent risk of the efficiency of power flows across board, sorry, to the efficiency. Prices in zones that are delineated according to network congestions are more reflective of local conditions, whereas larger zones may suffer from internal network congestion, um, which do not tend to accurately reflect local conditions in their uniform wholesale prices. They then give an example of the economic skew that can happen. So if you imagine in the top market, market one, you have Scotland and England in a single bidding zone, and then the constraint is the Cheviot constraint. That then impacts on differential market pricing between that single bidding zone in market one and the bidding zone in market two, call it Ireland, the island of Ireland uh, transmission network. On the right-hand side, if in fact you've recognized structural constraints between Scotland and England, you have separate bidding zones within the GB transmission network. And that's what, in fact, we used to have before Wales joined um, England and Scotland back in time of old, like early 2000s, I think. Um, if you recognize that that constraint exists, you can separate it out into two separate bidding zones, and that then produces a more efficient use of price signaling and, and market flows. That's, that's the economic theory behind it. Right, the, that's essentially my second point, therefore, is that it makes no sense, either in terms of economics, in terms of overall structure, to have separate definitions of congestion for interconnectors and for internal congestion. The third point is that that's borne out by an holistic construction of the legislation. And this, I'm afraid, is where um, I was hoping that, uh, to, to reach here by 12, but I've reached here early, so I'm hoping that's encouraging rather than discouraging. There's now, I'm afraid, a paper chase through the recast regulation, which is right. uh, uh, um, based on previous experience, it's somewhat painful. <laughs> okay. I, I don't mean to be rude, but um, the reality is there's quite a lot to take in with a lot of definition, and it is rather technical. So which one are we in? We're in uh, we've read that regulation. I'm, I'm trying to reduce the pain. <coughs> reduce the pain. Give us an analgesic. Um, yeah. what, what are the key provisions? I mean, we've, we've read it, we've agonised it, we've looked at the terms, we're familiar with them. We have thought about it. 
Yeah. My Lord, can I go very quickly and just tell you what the key points are as I go? <laughs> <laughs> I know she's not. <laughs> I'm ahead of time. <laughs> um, page 286, please. Uh, we have the beginning of the regulation. You can see that the purpose behind the recast regulation is to repeal and replace in recital one in the light of substantial changes that have been made. So this is codification there. Mm. Uh, we then see in uh, paragraph, recital three, sorry, a recognition that there's significant change going on in the industry. What's that referring to? Well, it's referring to the decarbonisation project, substantial uh, increase of renewable energy, and so on. The things that Mr Tyndall has uh, referred to in his witness evidence. Recital 60 refers to the what I've called the CACM regulation and cost zone capacity allocation. That's simply to, to flag up, it's referring to another piece of legislation. Therefore, one would expect a consistent approach. Recital 31 confirms uncoordinated curtailments of internet, interconnected capacities increasingly limit exchange of electricity between member states and are an obstacle to trade. Just pausing there, that's if a member state had congestion in its transmission system. Where, where in 31? It's the first sentence, my lord. Sorry. Uncoordinated curtailments of interconnected capacities limit the exchange. So if a member state facing congestion in its own transmission network is making one of them. Respond to that I'm by turning... I'm being super group. Recite 31. Uh, did I say 31? I'm sorry, I missed. Yes. I meant 27. Sorry, they sound okay. very similar. <laughs> it's my own fault. I'm, I'm looking ahead of the wrong. I'm going to 31 next. Um, 27. Uncoordinated curtailments of interconnected capacities limit the exchange of electricity between member states and so on. The maximum level of capacity of interconnectors should therefore be made available. So what a member state can't do in response to congestion in its own system is turn off the tap on an interconnector. That would be one solution because you'd stop an external flow of electricity coming across the border. But it's not yeah. what would be consistent with. Put shortly, congestion within a system is an obstacle to internal trade. Yes. And it refers to the meshed grid and the fact that um, internal congestion will have an impact on cross zonal trade. Mm. Something which puzzled me, I, I think the answer is fairly obvious. <coughs> this. EU retained legislation which now applies is hitherto an internal market measure. We're no longer part of the internal market. No one is suggesting that because we're dealing with an interconnected European system of which we're still an integral part, no one's suggesting that internal market provisions should not, or principles should not, flow into the EU retained rule. Yeah. Just, just a matter of commercial, technical, engineering reality. We are interconnected. We need to have the same rules as everyone else in Europe. And it needs to work. And it needs to work. I mean, there's nothing about the fact it's EU retained law which alters the basic economics behind the provisions and our and our political desire to live with them and work with them. Yes. And the, and, and the, the, the regulation which is a tab eight. Uh, the re, the, the um, retained. Yeah, the retained yeah. EU law regulation, I'll put it that way, contains yeah. exactly the same. Recitals. Page, uh, page 372 has the same. 361 is 27. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and page 372 is the same definition of ancillary service. Yes. Not including congestion management. Yeah. So it was open to the legislature in this jurisdiction to change that. They didn't. And of course, they were relying upon provisions in the uh, 2020 Act that enabled defects arising from implementation post-Brexit arrangements to be put in place. This wasn't a sea change in strategy or approach. This was simply curing defects, i.e. things that simply wouldn't work. So things like the, the um, interrelationship oh, well, with other regulators. It would be debatable to what extent there's any real consideration of those sorts of issues. But in, in, in theory, that's correct. It's a matter of statutory virus, I think that's what they have to satisfy themselves. But it's true that we're dealing with a lot of... Well, you can legitimately say they didn't change. Um, can I go back, please, to uh, recital 31? This time correctly, I hope. 
page 291. In, in essence, the point being made here is where you have internal congestion, another solution is to reconfigure your pitting zones. So the system is designed to alleviate internal congestion. One way of doing it is to have congestion management methods. Another is simply <coughs> you start from scratch by recognizing the structural congestion and splitting, for example, GB into Scotland and England, or Scotland and England and Wales. Um, what do you deduce from that? What's the inference one draws from that fact? Uh, you're necessarily viewing congestion as a, uh, a, a problem in an interconnected mesh, and there are different ways of dealing with it. One way is capacity allocation, another is to reconfigure your bidding zone, another is to come up with congestion balance. Capacity balance. of reducing the hindrance to internal trade. Exactly. Internal market. Yes. Mm. And then paragraph 34. And in the middle of, sorry, 31. Just member states might adopt multinational or national plans to address congestion. That's your point. Yes. Congestion has got the broad definition because it's covering a multitude of sins. It, it can arise on an interconnector, it can arise between bidding zones, or it can arise internally. 34. The management of congestion problems should provide correct economic signals to transmission system operators and market participants, and should be based on market mechanism. That's market participants generally, and we'll see the definition of market participants is generators, suppliers, it's not just interconnectors, or people flowing across an interconnection. Um, in contrast, we then see uh, payments and receipts resulting from comp this is 36 payments and receipts resulting from compensation between TSOs should be taken into account when setting network tariffs. That's a, a cross reference to the ITC mechanism, which provides compensation for, say, for example, the, the national grid feels that its network is more congested as a result of cross border flows from Ireland. They get <coughs> some compensation for that in the form of a rev uh, revenue payment another TSO in Ireland, and that can be put towards reducing network charges. Right, we then please move on to the meat of the regulation, page 297. I've taken my lords already to subparagraphs 1, 4, and 6. Please could I invite you to read subparagraphs 10 through to 17 which deal separately from the question of congestion with the issue of balancing. So, sort of, um, maybe it's just me, but I, I have a little bit of difficulty in distinguishing between imbalance and congestion. Imbalance, imbalance will lead to congestion. Imbalance is the system as a whole, so it's the matching off of demand versus supply for the system as a whole, because the transmission network as a whole has to be kept in balance. So the frequency, if you have differential demand and supply, can lead to differential frequencies, which cause problems in power. So it's, uh, I follow. Yeah. Whereas congestion will be a particular bottleneck within the transmission system itself. They're interrelated, but their point is, I suppose, from a technical and commercial point, they're just different costs. They are different costs. And they're marked as different costs by uh, grid when they're charging. Uh, yeah. Balancing costs are dealt with under the BSC mechanism, and constraint management costs under the sewer yeah. scheme. Uh, are charged in generators. Well, they're both charged in generators, but under a different code. Yeah. Can we then please look at uh, um, subparagraph 25, defines market participant. That has a broad definition, includes generators, aggregators, demand response units, energy storage services, and so on. So it isn't simply interconnectors and people who deal with interconnectors. Redispatching is a measure 
including curtailment, that is activated by one or more transmission system operators, ignore DSOs because that's not us, by altering the generation load pattern or both in order to change physical flows in the electricity system and relieve a physical congestion or otherwise ensure system security. So re redispatching basically says you in the south, you the generators in the south will now produce more than we'll pay you. You the generators in the north need to turn off your turbines and we'll pay you as well. And it's the costs of those payments that are congestion management for the GB network. Now in contrast, counter trading is a means of dealing with uh, fiscal congestion as well, but it's a cross zonal exchange initiated by system operators between two billion. So you can have TSO uh, number one in one bidding zone talking to TSO number two in another bidding zone and agreeing between them how they're going to manage flows between the bidding zones, and that's counter trading. But it's a cross zonal exchange, it's not necessarily an exchange across an interconnect between member states. Uh, 31 and 32 have some examples of balancing products, so again balancing is dealt with discreetly. 60 I've dealt with. At page 300, subparagraph 65 defines a bidding zone as the largest geographical area within which market participants are able to exchange energy without capacity allocation. So that reflects the bidding zone literature document that you saw from Ofgem, where they're it became an industry standard term, it then became crystallized in, in legislation. Capacity allocation means the attribution of cross-zonal capacity, 66, and 70 then says cross-zonal capacity means the capability of interconnected system to accommodate energy transfer between bidding zones. I'm inviting you there to draw a distinction between uh, energy transfer between bidding zones and the definition of congestion, which is transfers between network areas. And the reason they're different is because 2.4 is necessarily broader and goes further than simply dealing with the transfer of energy between bidding zones. Otherwise, the EU legislature would have been perfectly capable of describing in Article 2.4 congestion by reference to congestion between bidding zones. But it didn't. It described it as between network areas because of an impact on fiscal flows on network elements. <coughs> Ungeographically defined, not tied into bidding zones, it's a general broad term. Network areas not defined. Network, network areas is not defined. But natural and ordinary meaning, it's an area of a network. I know that's yeah. a bit unsatisfactory, but given that you've got bidding zone as a defined term, a perfectly acceptable term, yeah. encompasses a replacement to member states, it would have been the easiest thing in the world to say congestion is between bidding zones, ergo it's a replacement for the member states. They didn't, they went broader. Uh, and as we'll see, that reflected a suite of legislation that recognised congestion can be structural, internal, interconnected congestion. Mm. There are different types of congestion, and they're dealt with in slightly different ways. They're all congestion. So, if we well, then... You can legitimately say that if, if the definition of congestion in forward had been intended to be limited to interconnected, it wouldn't have said so. Yes, and it used to in 2009. So, it, yeah. so it used to be expressly tied into congestion on the interconnector affecting trade between uh, member states, but that was also because of uh, capacity constraints in the transmission network, which is the and or definition in the 2009 yeah. regulation I'll come on to. But um, if we turn please to 301, just so I can cover this off en passant. So Article 5 and 6 deal with balancing responsibility and the balancing market. So Article 5.1 imposes an obligation on all market participants to be responsible for ensuring they keep the system in balance. What that means in practice is you have to uh, forecast what you will be adding to the system and forecast what you will take off of it. And if you get it wrong, uh, you will uh, pay penal prices. So there's an encouragement to keep everyone within the forecast injections and removals of energy from the overall transmission network. Balancing market is then dealt with in Article 6, and we see, for example, in Article 6.4, settlement for standing balancing products shall be based on marginal pricing, etc. So there's a separate system for pricing the balancing products that deal with balancing, which is separate from <coughs> the payments that go to relieve congestion. 
um, we see also that there is, in fact, a separate guideline that has been made under Article 611 of the Electricity Regulation dealing with the detailed rules for electricity balancing. And we haven't wearied you with that because it's not relevant because we're not dealing with balancing. Could we then please look at Article 13.3, which deals with redispatching? You've seen the definition of redispatching. This explains that ordinarily, see 13.1, we have to deal with uh, redispatching through objective, transparent, non discriminatory criteria. It has to be market based, etc. There's then some uh, explanation of that. You can resort to non market based redispatching only where no market based alternative is available. They've all been used. Or D, the current grid situation leads to congestion in such a regular and predictable way that market-based redispatching would lead to regular strategic bidding, which would increase the level of internal congestion, and the member state concerned either has adopted an action plan to address this congestion or ensures that minimum available capacity for cross-zone trade is in accordance with Article 16.8. The 16.8 provision deals with you can't turn off the tap for an engine connector yeah. to deal with your own internal congestion. But again, this is dealing with a solution to internal congestion because it precisely because it will have an impact on cross-border trade. Uh, in contrast, at page 309, we see uh, <coughs> provisions dealing with bidding zone review and capacity allocation. And you've seen that capacity allocation is the allocation of cross-zonal capacity, so between bidding zones. We see under paragraph 1, member states shall take all appropriate measures to address congestions is an interconnected congestion. And it then suggests bidding zone borders shall be based on long-term structural congestion. We've seen that. Bidding sh zones shall not contain su such structural congestions unless they have no impact on neighbouring bidding zones, and so on. There's then a reference to reductions in cross-zonal capacity, and uh, there's then a review every three years from the overall regulator, the EU regulator, on structural congestions and physical congestions between and within bidding zones. And then three, in order to ensure an optimal configuration of bidding zones, a bidding zone review shall be carried out. The review shall identify all structural congestions and include an analysis of different configurations which might alleviate it. Under subparagraph sub seven, where structural congestion has been identified in the report um, uh, or the bidding room, zone review or by one or more transmission system operators in their control areas. Um, the member state with identified structural congestion shall, in cooperation with the TSO, uh, establish national or multinational action plans or amend their bidding zone configuration. Action plans are then dealt with in Article 15.1. All of these areas, these issues, are just simply illustrative of problems arising through congestion which is within a system. Yes. Is there anything which the respondents to your cross appeal have identified from here which suggests that it is limited to an interconnector? Is there any provision here? The only provision expressly limits it to interconnector congestion is that found at page 315 in Article 19. Which is now dealing with congestion income, which cross refers back to um, General Principles of Capacity Allocation and Congestion Management in Article 16. So I'll come on to Article 16 in a moment, but in answer to my Lord's question specifically... Isn't this really the point of this appeal? Your opponent is going to identify something which suggests that systemically congestion costs are limited to the interconnector and not the system. Yes. In which case they've got to identify something in the recast, which is not just illustrative of the fact that costs might arise on an interconnector, but that's the defining characteristic of congestion costs. The only reference to interconnect congestion specifically is 19.2b, where uh, a, a priority is identified for maintaining or increasing cross-zonal capacities through optimization of existing interconnectors uh, or covering costs resulting from network investments that are relevant to reduce interconnect congestion. So even then, it's not specific to costs arising from interconnector congestion. It's uh, what you're trying to do is account for network investments that are designed to relieve interconnector congestion. Yeah. It, it's clear that interconnector con 
congestion can occur. Yes. The question is whether there's any language suggests it's the it's cost relating to that which is the only thing. Not that I found. Mm -hmm. so Article 60 deals with capacity allocation, which is the cross zonal. But the, the reference <coughs> even here, so this this is the high water mark as I understand it, Gemma's case is well. Look, at, there's a reference there to congestion management. That's in the context of capacity allocation. Therefore, the two are the same thing. Therefore, because capacity allocation only deals with congestion on an interconnector, ergo, it's only congestion on an interconnector that is rather than congestion. If we actually look at... Rather uh, defeated by the capacity allocation and congestion management. Yes. Rather than all congestion. Capacity allocation is one of the means of relieving allocation, uh, congestion on an interconnector, but it's not, therefore, definitive of what is congestion. And indeed, we see in subparagraph 1 of Article 16, Network congestion problems shall be addressed with non-discriminatory marketplace solutions which give effective economic signals to the market participants and transmission system operators involved. We're just pausing there. Market trans trans uh, participants includes all of the domestic mm -hmm. generators, suppliers, demand response, and so on. Network congestion problems, generic, can be solved by non-transaction based methods. When taking operational methods to ensure that transmission system remain in a normal state, the transmission system operators shall take into account the effect of those measures on neighbouring control areas. So what you're doing is dealing with your own congestion but making sure you don't beg your neighbour when doing so. And we then see subparagraph 2, curtailment procedures shall only be used in emergency situations, i.e. cutting somebody off entirely, um, namely where the TSO must act in an expedition manner and redispatching or counter-trading is not possible. You've got my submission that redispatching is domestic, counter-trading is cross zone. And that has to be uh, uh, non-discriminatory as well. Turning to the next page, 312, 16.4, says the maximum level of capacity of the interconnection and the transmission networks affected by cross-border capacity shall be made available to market participants. So it's recognising both, capacity on both will have to be made available. Um, we then see in subparagraph 8, CSO shall not limit the volume of interconnection capacity to be made available to market participants as a means of solving congestion inside their own bidding zone, or as a means of managing flows resulting from transactions internal to bidding zones. So again, well, it's... Anything referring to internal congestion. Yeah. It can't be referring to interconnect congestion. Yeah, exactly. and, and then we see... Uh, Subparagraph 13. By definition, if, if you were doing that to limit interconnector capacity, then you wouldn't have congestion at the interconnector. You'd have self the reverse. Yeah. You, would, you would have cured the problem. Uh, Subparagraph 13 of page 313. When allocating costs of remedial actions between transmission system operators, <coughs> uh, regulatory authorities shall analyse to what extent flows from transactions internal to bidding zones contribute to the congestion between two bidding zones and allocate the cost based on the contribution to congestion. So essentially where you've got a, an impact on cross-zonal uh, congestion, you're going to divvy up the cost between them. But it's making clear that that will result from congestion internal to a particular bidding zone. Uh, and you have to consider what the counterfactual would be without a structural congestion in place. So if it's your fault because you haven't taken steps to deal with the structural congestion, you're going to bear the cost. And if you've managed to impede somebody else's congestion or uh, contribute detrimentally to somebody else's congestion, you're going to have to pay them some money if it's your fault. That's essentially what it's suggesting. Right, we then come on, please, to Article 18. Now, in contrast to that section dealing with capacity allocation and so on, we then have network charges. It's these network charges that, as I've indicated, are applied to generators. They're not paid by interconnectors. Uh, we see that from subparagraph 1, charges applied by network operators for access to networks, including charges for connection, charges for the use of the network, and where applicable charges for related network reinforcements. We're just pausing there. Any form of network reinforcement would be building more cables. An alternative to network reinforcement is constraining um, generation, constraining demand either side of a bottleneck so that you don't have to build more cables. And that is a de facto form of network reinforcement, or a, a, a functional substitute. They have to be cost reflected, take into account the need for network security and so on, reflect actual costs. Um, and then uh, they are 
payable for network access. We've seen from the Gemma P396 decision, interconnectors don't pay those network access costs because it's perceived to be prohibited by the electricity regulation. They pay different charges through the ITC mechanism um, and through capacity allocation, but they won't be paying network charges. And it's, the ITC is, is harmonizing network charges only. That's subparagraph three. We then see where appropriate the level of tariffs applied to producers or final consumers or both shall provide local locational signals. So again, that's reflecting you're not going to be charging these two interconnectors. Um, but it has to reflect not only the, the amount of network losses, so a, a transmission system, if electricity is flowing from the, this place of generation in Scotland to Plymouth, there will be some losses on the line because of transferring electricity over a cable produces a thermal output, which uh, is energy lost. And it, it's, um, that, that, therefore, the, what you stick in as 100 will be 99 when it arrives at, at Plymouth. So network losses is one example. The other is congestion caused. So this is expressly recognizing that a feature of a charge for access to the network will be reflecting the congestion caused. Interconnectors don't pay these charges. Therefore, it must be congestion that is purely internal to a transmission network uh, for which charges are being levied. And the rationale for that, I repeat, is because it's the functional equivalent of building infrastructure to solve the problem. We then see in, in subparagraph five, these charges are without prejudice to charges resulting from congestion management referred to in Article 16. So you can have, through capacity allocation, a, um, uh, a form of um, revenue stream. Um, you could conceivably have network charges, sorry, charges being raised separately for congestion management under Article 16 because that's dealing with non-market-based methods for dealing with congestion. So that could conceivably be something you did. But basically, these provisions are therefore working hand in glove to ensure that they you are know, both dealt with in the same framework. We then see, subparagraph six, there shall be no specific network charge on individual transactions for cross-zone trading of electricity. So it's not just interconnectors, it's anyone who is transferring electricity between different zones will not be subject to a network charge under Article 18. Could we then please go to Article 49 very briefly, because it shows you the structure of the ITC mechanism, page 333. So the ITC mechanism was part A of the guidelines in the ITC regulation. I, I haven't dwelt on it. It, it. it essentially provides a compensation mechanism for the costs that a TSO will experience from having to entertain or host cross-border flows of electricity. And we see in Article 49 that that is maintained. Article 59 then empowers the Commission to establish network codes. And so you have the suite of delegated legislation that is dealing with a number of things. Uh, one of those things we see in subparagraph A at the bottom of page 338 is a series, <coughs> a series of things that might be covered by network codes. Uh, and we see in the final line, final full line, availability plans of relevant assets, adequacy analysis, ancillary services. And that stands apart from all of the other uh, descriptions of things that have gone before. And in contrast, at the top of, top of page 339, uh, we see capacity allocation and congestion management rules. They are going to be subject to a separate network code dealing with masses that we've already been looking at, which are different ways of managing constraints. So uh, not only capacity allocation, but also um, uh, redispatching and so on. A series of procedures, bidding zone reconfiguration, for example, is dealt with there as well. That, happily, <laughs> is all I need to do with the recast regulation. The remaining regulations I could be much quicker with because there are um, more specific provisions that I'd like to draw to the court's attention. The first is the system operation guideline regulation, the 
behind tab five in this bundle. Uh, you can pick it up, please, at page 85. This is Commission Regulation establishing a guideline on electricity transmission system operation. This essentially ensures that there can be a safe system operating within uh, operational guidelines. Deals with operational efficiency and security and so on. At page 96, we see the objectives of the measure. Article 4. It's designed to ensure the common operational security arrangements, um, determining interconnected system operational planning principles, and so on. So that's the aim. At um, page 108, we have in Article 22, E and F, page, again. page 108, um, E and F, about five paragraphs down, we see a contrast between redispatching uh, transmission system users within the TSO's control area between two or more TSO's or counter trade between two or more bidding zones. So that you can have redispatching within the TSO's control area, or you can have redispatching between two or more TSO's. So it's internal, in counter distinction to counter trading between two or more bidding zones. Article 55 is at page 126. Tasks of the TSA regarding system operation include, uh, under B, developing and deploying tools and solutions for the prevention and remedy of disturbances, and then under C, use services provided by third parties through procurement when applicable, such as redispatching or counter-trading, congestion management services, generation reserves, and other ancillary services. So it's, it's treating congestion management and redispatching as ways of uh, dealing with operational issues. And then at Article 76, page 138. Under uh, provision dealing with the proposal for regional operational security coordination, uh, subparagraph 1b, Roman 5, we see that there's a reference to the sharing of the costs of remedial action complementing where necessary the common methodology. As a general principle, cross, costs of non-cross-border relevant con congestion shall be borne by the TSO responsible for the given control area. And costs of relieving cross-border relevant congestion shall be covered by TSOs responsible for the control areas in proportion to the aggravating impact of any exchange, energy exchange between given control areas <coughs> on the congested grid element. So where there is a relevant cross-border impact, you have a system of allocating costs between two TSOs. When it's your own structural problem in your own transmission control area, uh, it's on you. And we then see <coughs> subparagraph two. In determining whether congestion has cross-border relevance, TSA shall take into account the congestion that would appear in the absence of energy exchanges between control areas. So you have to look at it as if it's in the raw without any influence from a, a cross zonal input of electricity. Just for your note, page 108, one sees, 108, sorry I've got that wrong, it's article 108, page 153, there's a reference specifically to ancillary services. Yeah, that doesn't deal with congestion. And then finally, at page 202, <coughs> Annex 6, bottom of the page, when dealing with FCR, which is Frequency Containment Reserves. Sorry, I'm just catching up. Can you give me that reference again? Oh, 202. Thank you. When dealing with... Um, Frequency containment reserves in a synchronous area. Uh, bottom of the table, third column. It's 
so final row, third column, TSOs of the synchronous area, which is an area which can transfer electricity between them without uh, impediment, shall have the right to specify in the synchronous area operational agreement limits for the exchange of FCR in order to avoid internal congestions in the case of activation of FCR, ensure an even distribution of FCR, uh, and avoid the stability of FCP or operational security being affected. So again, it's a reference to internal congestions necessarily feeding into the operational constraints yeah. that we agreed. Um, Packham re regulation is the next one. Um, and then I'm on the home straight. Packham regulation is a bundle of authorities to tab 28, page 1120. Tab. Sorry, uh, tab 28, page 1120. It was a late edition. I hope it's made its way into your lordship's bundle. So in the uh, clip, no, it's, it came separately. Yeah, it's, it's probably a CJU judgment first, and then yeah, yeah. Yeah. fit in. No, I'm sorry. <coughs> it's, it's, what is this? This is a uh, regulation dealing with capacity allocation and congestion management. Recital ten, page eleven twenty one says TSO should use a common set of remedial actions such as counter-trading or redispatching to deal with both internal and cross-zonal congestion. So the actions that TSO take will affect both. Mm -hmm. uh, is, this, is this EU retained law? Is it really? I think it is. It was in force in any event at the date of the decision. Um, and I let my lord know after the short adjournment. I'll double check. I did uh, double check the other one, and that was retained in the law. That was the, that was the balancing guideline. Um, uh, recital 12 then says TSO should implement coordinated redispatching of cross border relevance or counter trading at regional level. Uh, so, again, this, this reiteration of there can be congestion with cross border relevance or not. We then see at page 1125, a series of definitions starting at subparagraph 16. Congestion income is defined in 16 as the revenues received as a result of capacity allocation. And then we see three separate definitions of congestion. If the court would be kind enough to read those. The first, market congestion, is expressly tied to cross-zonal capacity, but the other two are freestanding. Fiscal congestion, structural congestion couldn't be there in those terms if it was limited to interconnected congestion. Page 1127, part of the purpose of congestion management cooperation is ensuring optimal use of the transmission infrastructure. It's paragraph B. It goes to the point I was making that um, constraint management in GB is a functional means of avoiding building more things. Article 35, then, at page 1149, deals with coordinated redispatching and counter-trading. Yeah. Subparagraph 2 has the same allocation of responsibility. Uh, you will have coordinated redispatching, which has to include actions of cross-border relevance um, in order to effectively to relieve fiscal congestion, irrespective of whether the reasons for the fiscal congestion fall mainly outside their controlled area or not. Um, 
and they have to address the fact that they may significantly influence flows outside the control area. Each TSO may redispatch all available generation units, and that's within their internal systems, with the appropriate mechanism and agreements applicable to its control area, including interconnectors. Right, I think that's enough from Hacker. I'm sorry, 35.3, just... Um, that's the bit I just read, it's read that. The Electricity Directive 2009 uh, is an applicable measure because it was in force at the date of the decision. It's in Vulnerable Authorities 1, tab 2, turn please to page 54. Under Article uh, Subparagraph 6, so Article 37.6, it says the regulatory authorities shall be responsible for fixing or approving methodologies for connection and access to national networks. That's Subparagraph A. Sub subparagraph B is the provision of balancing services. <clears throat> and then Subparagraph C is different. It says, including the procedures for the allocation of capacity and congestion management. Nine, however, makes clear that what the Directive has in mind at this stage is monitoring congestion management of national electricity systems, including interconnectors, and the implementation of congestion management rules. To that end, TSOs or market operators shall submit their congestion management rules, including capacity allocation, to the NRA's national regulatory authorities may request amendments to those rules. So that's not confined no. to interconnector congestion. Uh, and that has congestion management on a national electricity system. And even if we take the high water mark of Mill and Friends case, which is the Electricity Regulation 2009, which has a uh, definition of interconnector at page 7. So this is tab 1 of this bundle, page 7. We find interconnector again is confined to a link between member states, see Article 2, 1, page 7. Yeah. And then under uh, Article 2, 2, C, congestion means a situation in which an interconnection linking national transmission networks cannot accommodate all physical flows resulting from the international trade requested by market participants because of a lack of capacity of the interconnectors and or the national transmission systems concerned. So, even in the high water mark of their case, there's still the, the, the there's still the possibility for congestion on the national transmission system alone to cause problems with flowed electricity between two member states. That's all the change. I mean, the word accommodate I struck me as significant. If there's congestion within a system, it may have a back, it may back up, and mm. but it means you can't get onto the interconnector because the system yeah. is preventing you getting on. Yeah. I mean, if there's a cause, there's <coughs> is the internal congestion, yeah. which is why the and or is important. Yeah. There was a point taken by the CMA, I think it's probably still maintained, as, well, this is all to do with cause rather than effect. Well, oh, yes, yeah, quite, exactly, full stop. <laughs> but congestion is the problem. Yeah. The, 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 the symptom is you the, can't the, flow your electricity. The, the congestion that's, that's being referred to here is... Uh, includes congestion within the national transmission yeah. system. Well, we agree it's cause. That's the cause of the congestion. There's yeah. a blockage internally. And it may then back up. It mean you can't get your electricity from France into the UK or from Northern Ireland into Ireland, whatever it is, wherever the connector is not part of it. And that's what, that's what the, the, this package of measures is designed to ensure cross-border trade in an interconnected system where the impact of one transmission system operator can have a knock-on impact on the neighbour be that bidding zone, member state, or network area. That, but that in, in essence, is, is my submission on this part of the um, case.
Um, I could refer you to other provisions in the electricity regulation that also envisage congestion being on a domestic network as well as an interconnector, but may I save that for a reply? I need to, because ultimately my submission is it's the recast regulation that now tells you what the answer is. Yeah. The travaux preparatoire for the ITC regulation I did say I'd come to, uh, I hope I can do so briefly. Supplemental Bundle 1, Tab 2, page 9. This is what's set out in, in Annex 1 to the German decision, to the IOC regulations. With respect, that's the OGEG guidelines, which are behind Tab 1. Um, I'm looking at Tab 2, which is the Commission Impact Assessment. Sorry, this is the impact assessment for the ITC regulation itself. I'll need to come on to deal with the impact assessment for the recast regulation. The OGE guidelines are correctly set out in the German decision. I'm not proposing to go there. I'll go there in reply if I need to. It's true that they seem to have viewed charges for congestion as being um, not within the scope of generation charges. Um, but that isn't how it's being dealt with in the legislation itself. To the extent that there was any confusion about it, it was put at rest by the clarificatory words in the recast regulation. The travaux preparatoire for the ITC regulation itself, so this is the, the commission assessment that my own friend Smith took you to. If we could go to page 16, please. Third paragraph down. Individuals, TSOs, must manage the effects of cross-border flows on the grid for which they are responsible, even though the flows may not have originated on their system. And this is part of the reason behind the ITC mechanism that the ITC regulation put in place. Cross-border flows causing internal congestion, which the TSO must manage. Um, transmission lines have a maximum capacity. Uh, congestion is said to exist. Usually the responsibility of TSOs to manage this within the system for which they are responsible, for example, by instructing some generators to reduce production. And increasing other generators' production so the lines are not overloaded. That is precisely what I've been describing as uh, redispatching, uh, which is one of the classic ways of dealing with that <coughs> if you're not going to build more network infrastructure in order to uh, reduce the bottleneck. Um, there's then a separate issue. If you have that problem as a result of cross border flows, then somebody else's flow of electricity is causing you a problem, and that's where the ITC compensation mechanism comes in. We then see at um, page 17, third paragraph down, that that need for compensation has been recognized. Um, the compensation should be arranged between TSOs and subsequently charged or paid back to national users. So where you have part of the congestion is attributable to a cost cross-border flow, you have an ITC mechanism compensation payment, the NRA in a particular transmission network can then set that off against network charges because it's had an impact on network congestion. 18, uh, page 18, fifth paragraph down, recognizes that this is going to be a bigger problem in the future because of wind, because of wind generation, electricity generation from wind. Increasing amounts of wind will have an impact both on cross-border flows and on unnecessary infrastructure. That's the point uh, my Lord Chancellor made. Mm. Page 20. Under tariff harmonisation. So that's been dealing with the ITC mechanism. This is now moving on to tariff harmonisation. Second paragraph down. Tariffs are the charge for local system users for the use of the transmission system. Um, C, Article 18 of the Recast Regulation. The main elements of the tariff represent the cost of investment and operation and maintenance of the infrastructure, considered to be fixed in the short term. In addition, the cost of managing congestion on the system are also met by TSO. Uh, tariffs are paid to the TSO to whose system the user is connected. That's the constraint management costs <coughs> that are in the BISUOS charges that we say should be within uh, the exception to the exclusion of the ancillary services exclusion, because it's congestion management. And then uh, finally, page 59 to 60. We see that 
the impact assessment is dealing with losses and congestion. In the sec second section on that page. And we see at the top of page 60, in Europe, rather than calculate a price for each node, price zones generally covering an entire country have been established. The costs of congestion and losses are then managed by the system operator as part of its regulated activities. So uh, what we see is that um, if there's an expectation that TSOs will be charging network charges to generators for managing congestion. Uh, and we've seen that congestion is, is now excluded <coughs> from the concept of ancillary service. My uh, fourth submission in the skeleton was that uh, congestion is not the same as balancing. I think the uh, lordships have that point on the already. The fifth point uh, was that nothing has changed with the EU retained EU law regime. As a matter of uh, fact, uh, the retained EU law was not the applicable law at the time of the decision. But even if one looks forward as to what should be the holistic interpretation, you've seen that the interpretation mirrors the interpretation of the recast regulation. Uh, would your lordships be kind enough to give me a moment? Uh, those are my submissions on the cross appeal. Can I just ask you this one question? If, if um, it were the case that congestion management costs were not recovered through the transmission charge, where elsewhere would they be recovered? Presumably, they, they have all things have to be recovered one way or another, and they're covered under one regime or another, and it's more or less favourable. So they would have to be recovered somewhere under some other system. There's no provision within the EU legislation for dealing with the domestic charging arrangements because that's left to the, the member states. As a matter of practice in this country, um, constraint management is dealt with in the Basuals charges that Mr Tindall identified. And he's identified those Basuals charges that go to constraint management and those yeah. that don't. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a very, very elementary point. They are recovered somewhere. If not, if not subject to the permitted range, so not subject to that limit, they would be subject to something else. But, uh, in terms of the ITC overlay, as with every charge that is levied on a generator, the generator will pay those charges. Um, without the adjustment mechanism for TGR, for example, the generators were simply paying the costs of the local assets, the local circuits, yes. the GOS and everything else. All of those get charged. The question then is how they are factored into the separate calculation that the ITC regulation requires. So there isn't a specific provision either in the ITC regulation or in the recast regulation saying this is where you recover those costs. There is simply a, a, a recognition that those costs will form part of a series of costs that the National Regulatory Authority will recover. And the question then is can they be recovered as network costs? Uh, answer yes if it's internal congestion. No if it's costs associated with congestion on an interconnector because those should be borne by the interconnecting party and you can't charge generation charges to an interconnector. I hope that's the best answer I can give. Um, My Lords, I will briefly reply on our appeal and then hand over to Mr Rogers to make... Well, just how long do you think you will be? Um, I hope I'll be able to finish by lunchtime. So um, if I could address first our ground two, swap, uh, swap it round. Obviously our ground two only arises if we lose on ground one as to the correct interpretation of the obligations under the ICT regulations. So we only come to ground two if um, you find that it was unlawful to approve, uh, for GEMA to approve the original proposal as a stop gap measure to compliance. Now, yesterday, in response to questions from um, my Lord Lord Justice Green, I referred to a note that had been agreed between all counsel in the proceedings below, uh, which addressed GEMA's powers as regards transmission charges under the Directive, the Electricity Act, NGSO's license and the CUS. Um, we've unearthed copies of that, and I can hand them up. I sent them, I recirculated them to my learning friends uh, yesterday evening. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but it just might be a useful background. Um, we inserted in blue um, in so far as we can. Um, <coughs> thank you. Uh, 
I've inserted in blue uh, the, the references in this note were to the previous bundles, but we've inserted in blue references to these appeal bundles. Thank you very much. So I won't take you through that, but just um, that's there for background. Um, yesterday, Lord Justice Green also asked me at the outset of my submissions, and again raised similar points with Mr. Beale this morning, how GEMA should deal uh, with a hypothetical situation when it may be acting in breach of EU law, and he raised the point about being fettered by a private law contract cast. What is the mechanism to ensure compliance, particularly under, uh, including under Article 18 and 19 of the regulation? Now, yesterday, um, SSE's counsel referred your lordships to paragraph 18.17 capital A of the CUSC, and just, um, and he took you to it. It's a supplementary bundle to tab 25. Four. Yeah. And just to summarise that, that paragraph 817A gives GEMA the power to raise modification of its own motion. So rather than instruct an industry party to raise modification, uh, it gives the authority also the power to raise modification of its own motion, which GEMA can then approve itself where in particular, or inter alia, it considers that it's necessary for it to do so in order to comply with or implement EU law. So it's a shortcut in effect to uh, modifying the CUSC um, if there, it's necessary to do so to implement EU law. Now, that power was available to GEMA. On the facts of this case, GEMA did not, of course, think it was necessary to invoke that power in order to achieve compliance with the ITC regulation because, as I've explained at length yesterday, it considered that its approval of the original proposal would deliver compliance with the permitted range and further that such approval would not breach the requirements of the ITC regulation. Now, of course, that depends on whether we are correct on our appeal on ground one. So if I can then turn back to our appeal on ground one, and reply to the submissions that uh, SSE's council made in that regard yesterday and, and again this morning. <coughs> now, you will recall yesterday that my learned friend referred your lordships to the um, MMC, ex parte MMC judgment of the House of Lords. I won't take you back to that. But when he referred your lordships to that case, he summarised his case. He said, well, he said, the connection exclusion in the ITC regulation is a term of EU law which has only one meaning. And that the definition of charges for physical assets required for connection, as contained in the original proposal CMP 339, for your note, that's SB 1, tab 13, was wrong in law. That is, it did not precisely reflect the definition of the connection exclusion contained in the ICC regulation. All of that, my Lord, is uncontroversial in my submission. It's never been an issue uh, between the parties. And GEMA explicitly recognized and accepted that that was the case in the decision. However, in my submission and our submission, the fact that the definition, this definition of charges for physical assets required for connection does not precisely reflect the definition of the connection exclusion in the regulation does not mean that GEMA's decision approving it breaches the ITC regulation. And as I explained when I took your lordships yesterday painstakingly through the wording of the ITC regulation and the travel preparatoire. Our submission is that the principal obligation contained in Part B of the annex to the regulation is that the annual average transmission charges have to fall within the permitted range. That's the only obligation. Uh, it's the obligation, and in determining whether that obligation has been achieved or complied with, as the CMA put it in paragraph 3.35 of uh, its decision, and my learned friend uh, for the CMA took you to it yesterday, call 3, tab 24, page 597, the calculation and the definitions in part B, including the definition of the connection exclusion, we have always 
accepted, and we do accept, they are the constituent elements for assessing whether that primary obligation is met. Well, one obligation and, and a number of constituent elements as to how you satisfy it. My Lord, it. yes. It's and, no point. And it's perhaps it's principal secondary obligation. Yes. Uh, so I think mm. in response to questions from, I think, my Lord, Lord Justice Snowden, counsel for the SSE said, uh, and I wrote this down verbatim at the time, how, when, and by whom the calculation is to be carried out is not provided for in the regulation. And we agree. I wrote in, that down as well. Yeah. <laughs> instead, and I think he said, made, made a, fairly made a similar submission this morning, which I didn't write down quite as quickly. But, but <laughs> as I understand SSE's case, I understand it to be as follows. SSE argue that once GEMA incorporated into the CUSC a definition of charges for physical assets required for connection, which didn't precisely reflect the connection exclusion, it introduced a legal error and thereby acted unlawfully. As he put it, an illegality was baked in to the CUSC. And in our submission, that's where his reasoning breaks down. The incorporation of this definition into the CUSC does not reach the requirements of the ITC regulation. Now, counsel for SSE took you to the terms of the CUSC as amended by the original proposal. And if I could ask you to, to, to reopen that, because I didn't take it to you in my opening. Uh, um, and I'll briefly take you back to Supplementary Bundle 1, Tab 12. What's relevant at this point to the overall analysis? Well, my lord, the point is this. Uh, the, 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 he took you to that um, condition, showed you how. And, and, and there was some discussion between particularly my Lord, Lord Snowden and um, Lord Justice Snowden and, and SSE's counsel on the two parts of the original proposal. And it sets out how tariffs are to be set ex ante, specifically. And it also sets out a provision for ex post reconciliation of generated charges. Now, Mr. Beale yesterday for the SSE put some emphasis on the ex post reconciliation process. And he said the error, as he put it, that's been baked into the cask infects not just the ex ante definition of tariff charges or how they are to be calculated and adjusted, but also the ex post reconciliation. And I would like to make two points on that, <coughs> if I may. First, in the judicial review below, counsel for SSE did not develop any uh, significant arguments, only arguments at all based on the ex post reconciliation process. The only reference to the relevant paragraphs of the CUSC, paragraph 14, 17, that we've been able to find, appears in paragraph 30 of his skeleton for this appeal. That's core one, tab five, page 88. And certainly, as I believe Lord Justice Snowden commented yesterday, the ex post reconciliation process certainly played no part at all in the reasoning of the judge below. But the second and possibly more important point is this. The definition of charges for physical assets required for connection appears only in the amendments to the section of the CUSC, which set out how tariffs are to be set ex ante. It does not appear in the amended section of the CUSC, which makes provision for an ex post reconciliation. And if I can just ask you to look at, at those, at those I'll, I'll take it as quickly as I can. It's tab 12 in supplementary bundle one. I think the... In the interconnect, sorry, if you want to use a better word, between the two might be said to be in 141736. So when you That's to... right. Well, I'll take just jump to 141736. You've well, got then, the point. I'm going to take you out of your way. Well, but... well my lord, I, I, I think you've got the point, and I can give you the references. Page 195, those inserted paragraphs that are inserted into the paragraph 1445, sub paragraphs Roman 5 through to 7, clearly set out the setting of tariffs ex ante and adjustments to try to ensure ex ante that they fall within the permitted range. When you get to page 214, which is where we're dealing with ex post reconciliation, um, my Lord, Lord, Lord Justice Snowden is absolutely correct that in paragraph 14, 17, 36, a reference is made to the company that's an NGSO, producing a statement setting out annual average transmission charges paid in aggregate by generators in euros per megawatt hour as per paragraph 14.14.5. We say that language isn't um, totally clear, but 
In our submission, all it does is it simply requires NGESO to provide, produce this statement of annual average transmission charges, that term not being defined or in capitals in the CAS, paid in aggregate. And we say the cross-reference to power 14, 14, 5 is simply that these are the tariffs that have been set under the ex-ante tariff setting process. So it's the tariffs paid set under the ex-ante tariff setting process generally. And it then requires that the aggregate amount contained in that statement is compared with the upper limit or cap, that's paragraph 14, 17, 37, and a reconciliation amount is calculated if the cap is exceeded. And mutatis mutandis, the same process is carried out in paragraph 14, 17, 38 for um, the lower limit or floor. There's no requirement in paragraph 14, 17, 36 for the calculation required to assess aggregate charges paid by generators in the last year to be carried out using the definition, which is a defined term, capital letters, charges for physical assets required for connection, the definition that's set out in Supplementary Bundle 1, Tab 3. However, we do accept, my lords, that the reference in 14, 17, 36 is not crystal clear in that well, regard. You, there is an argument. But if you, yeah, if you do it as per paragraph 14, 14, 5, 14, 14, yes. 14, 5 includes the wrong definition. Yes. Then by definition, you've... Well, my lord, if... Yes. In the problem. If no. my lord one um, prefers that definition, and you are of the view that the cross-reference in 14, 17, 36 does require the ex-post reconciliation to be carried out using the incorrect definition, then we make the following submissions. GEMA is under an, still under an obligation regardless of the terms of the CAS, to ensure under the ITC regulation that annual average transmission charges fall within the permitted range. And GEMA accepts and has always accepted, um, at least since, well, no, it has always accepted, although there has been argument about what the correct interpretation of the connection exclusion actually is, but it has always accepted that it has to use the correct interpretation of the connection exclusion in determining or calculating whether the charges fall within that range and whether it has ensured compliance with that range. It's never shy from that argument that it is obliged by the ITC regulation <coughs> to ensure compliance with the range correctly interpreted. Now, as I have explained, and again yesterday, the effect of our decision was that average charges are unlikely to fall outside the range when one uh, assesses that with the correct interpretation of the connection exclusion for the next two or three years. That's the first point. We applied the correct interpretation of the connection exclusion to make an assessment as a matter of fact as to whether they would fall without the, in, outside the range. We came to the conclusion that they would not, at least for the next two or three years. But in the unlikely <coughs> event that we do have to carry out an ex post reconciliation process, that, and the amended CUSC 14, 17, 36 does not do the necessary job, then we would have to ensure compliance in some other way. In effect, therefore, we'd be in the position that we were in before the original proposal was accepted. Now, in that situation, as was recorded in the paragraphs of the CMA decision to which I referred your lordship sorry, could, yesterday. So, can I just pause for a second? This document that we're looking at. Yes. Well, both sets of amendments. Adopted. Yes. But before they were, yes. the adjustments were made on what an ad hoc basis, or would have been made on an ad hoc basis. The ex post reconciliation, -post -reconciliation would have been carried out. On an ad hoc basis. Absolutely, my lord. And I took you yesterday to the paragraphs of the CMA decision that recorded that. Those are the paragraphs 5537B. <coughs> And 5.38. I can take, take you back to those if you'd like me to do so. It's in yeah, well, core I mean, bundles. Well, where I'm going with this three. is, well, where I'm going with this is, does the ad hoc power continue to survive if you make express provision as to how you're going to do it? Well, my lord, there are two steps. First of all, there's the correct interpretation of the ex post reconciliation provision in the amended CUSC, 
And I have said that our primary reading is that it doesn't bake in the incorrect interpretation. Yeah. But if and in so far as it does, um, then there are, we do not shy away from the fact that we still have to ensure compliance with the range, applying the correct interpretation. And there are other ways in which that can be done. And the, way, and in the ways in which that can be done include those that are described uh, on the evidence of GEMA to the CMA, paragraphs 537B and 538 of GEMA's decision, which is core bundle 3598. That is, there can be ex post amendments to the tariffs, ex post amendments to the CUSC, or mid-year tariff changes. And as I said yesterday, my lord, this is not just a theoretical possibility. It is what actually happened and was actually proposed by SSE and EDF in their CMP 261. Now, you will remember that Mr. Beale took you yesterday to his pleading. Mr. Beale took you yesterday to his pleading, setting out the relevant history which it might be worth going back to, core bundle well, I think two. you should go back to, is it two o'clock? My Lord, it's gone one o'clock. Absolutely, I, 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 literally two minutes more, but well, I'll come back to it in two o'clock. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Seven ninety seconds starts now.